we are going to get started now. Uh, I believe we're going to have other people filtering in, but that is all right. Uh, so first off, thank you, uh, everyone who's coming in right now to see what we are here to talk about. Uh, and if you're watching this in the recording or on YouTube, thank you so much for tuning in to watch that. My name is Jonathan Lucas. Please call me John. I am the co-chair or one of the co-chairs for the Western Japan branch of the JET Alumni Association. Uh, I am based in Osaka and I work in Osaka tourism. Uh, JET AA, we are here to promote and help uh, our members, constituents, we should say, uh, people who live in Western Japan, everything from Nagoya to Okinawa and everything in between. Uh, if you are an alumni of the JET Association, we are held to help your professional development, help you connect with each other, and help form a community and support group for people in your careers and then as your lives as JET alumni. Um, and normally, we do host in-person events. However, due to current circumstances for the past two years, we've decided to start up a webinar series. It's been going pretty well so far. Uh, and this time, we have got uh, three different universities to talk about educational opportunities. So when you finish your JET opportunities, if you're already working, even as a post-JET, uh, how can you get back in education? What can you do? What opportunities are out there? Uh, we are very fortunate to have three reps from three different universities come and talk about their opportunities. Um, we will have each one of them go ahead and take 10 to 15 minutes to talk about uh, their university, what they have to offer, uh, what they recommend, what tips they might have for them. Uh, and then at the very end, we'll have a Q&A session for all three of them combined. So while you're listening in, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat uh, and then we'll go back and review them all later. So thank you all again for joining and thank you to our three speakers. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Liv, my other co-chair, who will be doing the general runnings today. Hi everyone. So as John lovingly introduced me, it was very, thank you so much for that. So my name is Liv, so I'm the other co-chair. I'm based in Kyoto. Right now I'm not in Kyoto and it's very cold where I am. So that's why I'm wearing a jumper. Anyway, so um, first we have three speakers from three different universities. So the, we will hear from Doshisha University, which has its main campus in Kyoto, but I might be corrected on that. There might be some other things going on that I need to be in, um, informed about. Then we will have Rid to Meikan Asia Pacific University, which is often shortened to APU. So throughout this presentation, it will probably just be referred to as that, which is mainly based in Kyushu, but they also have a campus which some of us might have seen in near Kyoto. And then we will also have a speaker from Temple University as well. So uh, I will stop talking and I will introduce the first of our speakers who is ready to go. So I will just put you on mute. So we have Greg from Doshisha University, if you'd like to begin. Okay, thank you, Liv. I'm just firing up things here. Great, can we see the screen okay? All right. So uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to be uh, speaking actually from the perspective of a current student. So I'm actually um, a second year uh, student in the uh, Doshisha Global MBA program. So just a bit about myself, a uh, quick introduction. So I'm originally from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. For those of you who might not know where that is, uh, just say it's in the West near the Rocky Mountains. I was on the JET program 2002 to 2005. Um, I actually uh, went to Ritsumeikang. I was in uh, what they called the SKP or study in Kyoto program, 2005, 2006. I went to a Japanese language school, uh, 2006, 2007. And I worked at the Hyatt Regency Kyoto Hotel between 2008, 2010. And I opened up my own small little tourism company in 2012, which is still um, going, but uh, due to COVID uh, haven't been as active. Um, and then I, I've been at Doshisha since 2020 and graduating in September. So uh, just some reasons for my, myself for choosing Doshisha, wanting to go back to get an MBA. I always had an uh, idea of getting an MBA uh, actually early on in my undergrad. Um, and I was looking for MBA programs. I wanted to stay in Kyoto and out of the programs I had uh, seen, uh, Doshisha seemed like a, a really good one. Um, 
I thought about uh, going into it because it would enhance my network, um, both personal and work wise. And actually I talked to uh, a few people who had gone through the program over the years. So actually probably since about 2012. Um, so I've been kind of, you know, following the progress uh, of the program um, and so forth. And um, it's also one of the top MBA programs in Kansai. And uh, they have three areas of uh, study, sustainability, green business, culture, creativity, and uh, investment in Asia. And I found the tuition to be very affordable. Um, they actually have a reduction of 30% to everyone. Um, and they uh, started to accept uh, or recognize work experience. If you have three plus years, um, they exempt you from the uh, GRE or the GMAT. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, it offers the three areas of study um, and uh, actually some of the top classes that I have enjoyed. Uh, there's actually marketing classes and, and a number of core courses. I enjoyed the marketing class, the sustainability responsible marketing class, which is an elective. And there's a couple of practical based classes I also uh, enjoyed. There was one interesting enough, it's a business of fashion industry. Um, so we actually had a... a uh, guest lecturer who is a CFO, um, Chief uh, Financial Officer at Diesel Japan. And he, he, he kind of taught us in, in a very practical way, um, our actual final um, uh, kind of report or, or, or kind of project, I guess is a better way of putting it. Um, we actually had to all play the roles of executive directors uh, on the board of directors and basically kind of come up with a pitch um, to all the other directors. Um, so it was really kind of a, a nice simulation. And there's also another class uh, based on entrepreneurship and tips on how to start your own business. So just to give you a quick rundown of what the program would entail. Um, so basically you have eight core courses. Um, you have eight elective classes um, and one intensive class, which would be a week long. You have what they call the um, CAT, so it's critical analytical thinking. It basically helps you to prepare for um, writing your thesis. And you have three seminar classes, which is involved uh, for you going along with your supervisor and, and writing a thesis. So it's all set after it's all said and done, after your uh, year one, year two, uh, you need a minimum of 42 credits. And um, basically, uh, it's, it's pretty um, intense. So it's broken every year is broken down into two semesters and each semester is broken down to what they call quarters. So basically each quarter is two months. Um, so you're doing uh, quite a bit of classes and then moving into your second year, you have the thesis um, or the research project. So uh, some advantages that I've, I've found, um, the compar comparison in terms of tuition um, so 1,631,000 yen or US dollars, 11,980, um, or in euros, 11,480. Um, so if you compare it to say programs outside of Japan in North America, for example, you know, I was looking at programs that were, you know, 30, 40, 50 and up, uh, thousand, uh, you know, American dollars. So for me, uh, Kyoto was, was definitely, or, or DBS, Doshisha Business School was definitely, uh, uh, you know, advantageous in that way. Um, we also have uh, students and faculty from all over the world. So in my batch, there's 13 people uh, from different countries. In the, the batch below me, the first years, I think there's maybe 20, you know, students from over 20 countries. Um, so it's just that multicultural kind of, um, you know, ability to, to kind of network and, and speak with people from all over the world. Um, I think that there's increasingly going to be more opportunities in Japan for non-Japanese such as ourselves um, due to COVID because I think there's a number of expats that went back um, and also just the, because of the declining population. Um, so getting an MBA in Japan I think could help uh, uh, you know us get uh, possibly a leg up or advantage of getting jobs here in Japan. Um, DBS once again one of the top programs in Kansai and it has a high brand value or is highly recognized throughout Japan. And also there's an access to the network of international alumni. So people have already graduated from DBS. And there's also a second um, program, it's called the JMBA. So it's the Japanese Business 
uh, program. However, with that, um, if you don't have Japanese language, it probably would be um, a little bit difficult to, to communicate, but there is that part of it. And there's, I think there's over 600 um, alumni in that uh, Japanese network as well. So some disadvantages or things to think about. Um, although it's not impossible, uh, a lot of jobs are gonna probably depend on your level of Japanese. So my, in my batch, uh, my classmates are going through the, the shukatsudo or job hunting. And, you know, I, um, they're, they're kind of worried about, you know, their Japanese level and stuff like that. However, having said that, last year's batch, uh, there were a number of students who had, you know, very, you know, maybe N3 um, or lower Japanese, and they managed to find jobs. Um, a fellow, uh, Yusuf, uh, he managed to find a really good uh, paying job, well-paying job, and, and he had little to no Japanese. So it is possible. However, also you're looking at entry level type jobs, maybe if uh, you don't have a lot of work experience. And as I've listed here, um, you, you can be starting at around 220,000 yen. Um, and the MBA, if you're looking overseas, it might not be as highly regarded um, because the rankings actually globally for Doshisha Business School are, are kind of lower than uh, a lot of the, uh, the other schools. Um, and also like the MBA in Japan is not as highly recognized. So you wouldn't be making that necessarily that much more money. Um, in some cases I've, I've seen only a 10 or 20,000, you know, extra per month to your salary. Um, and there's the possible, of course, the issues with language, culture, and food. So some, some classmates that I've seen um, have had a real difficult time um, you know, struggling with food issues, if they're vegetarian or because of religion, maybe, maybe they have to have, you know, uh, keep a strict uh, protocol in terms of, of what they eat, how they eat, um, and the language, uh, you know, being able to communicate, uh, you know, on a daily basis. So scholarships, um, Doshisha actually is interesting because for self-funding students like myself, they automatically offer you 30% off and then that can go to 50% or 100%. I lucked out and actually got 100% off my tuition. Um, so I was very, very uh, grateful for that. There's other scholarships uh, through private Japanese companies. Um, another fellow I knew a few years back, uh, he actually lucked out and a company basically just filled out application. Um, there was no interview. And you know, I think it was a month or two later, he had like uh, you know, 12,000 US dollars in his bank account. Um, so the, the, the scholarships opportunities are there. And then of course, with the government scholarships, um, the, uh, you know, through JICA and, and MEXT, there's definitely, um, some good, uh, options there. So making the transition, uh, back to school life, uh, I think for myself, uh, you know, I, I came into it a little bit kind of on the older side. So I'd been out of the academic world for a while. So I found that, you know, those of us who have been out of it for a while or the longer we're out of it, it's, it's more difficult possibly to kind of get back into the rhythm. Um, and some students were working part-time. Uh, I think that they, they, they had struggles from what I'd seen. So ideally I, I would, you know, if you can get a scholarship to be able to cover that, um, I think that would be the best uh, situation and you can focus on your studies. And uh, also with the thesis, um, that adds a bit of extra, well, actually I'll say a lot of extra kind of stress. So having, having um, you know, less um, or more, more time basically to spend on your studies would be definitely uh, a plus. So things to think about before committing to the MBA uh, in Japan. Well, I would, I would kind of ask yourself the question, are you thinking about working in Japan? Uh, because that will kind of determine um, you know, whether the MBA in Japan would be beneficial or not. Uh, I think in maybe depending on if you're in a developing economy or maybe a developed economy that might also uh, have sway or, or kind of um, uh, play a role in, in determining if a Japanese MBA would be good for you. And also, do you plan to work in an international company or a Japanese style company? because the Japanese style companies um, can be difficult to work in for us, us non-Japanese in terms of language and just the culture and the, and the expectations, obligations and so forth. 
Um, and also just to keep in mind, like if you get an MBA, like exactly how is that going to elevate your position from where you are now? Is that, is that gonna actually help you take you to kind of that next level? Or I've seen in, in my batch, there's, there's literally students who are 23, 24, 25. They have little to no work experience. And basically they just went into an MBA straight out of uh, their undergrad. Um, and they're basically stuck, I think, kind of looking for entry level positions. So the MBA and in, in, in from what I've seen doesn't necessarily help in that, in that situation. If you have a spouse or children or family, um, just thinking about you know, how that would work in terms of bringing them over um, and the lifestyle. Um, and then uh, are you going to be uh, a new graduate or a mid-career hire? Uh, as I mentioned briefly, some of the, the uh, students in my batch um, are, are kind of having to figure out, you know, are they going to be in, in an entry-level position or can they move into a, a mid-career hire and, and possibly make more money or, or have better benefits? So job hunting and internships. Uh, we actually have a career counselor uh, who helps with the interviews, resumes, and teaching, teaching everybody about the, the unique Japanese uh, hunting process, and the system, the approaches. Um, inter internships are available, uh, but what I found is it depends on the industry and along with the individual's experiences and skill sets, um, that'll kind of determine whether or not you can get in um to uh, a lot of these and it seems like right now the engineering technology or science-based jobs uh are are the ones that are kind of of high demand um and those ones seem to have uh or require less japanese skills so that's pretty much uh everything from my end uh here's some contact details um so if you'd like to contact me here's my email and dbs um, I don't know how many of you are going to be phoning, but uh, actually, if you just uh, go to their contact page, actually, they had the fax. I took that off. Um, but uh, if you want to contact them, they have a contact page. Uh, you can just kind of go there and send in um, a message uh, and they'll be happy to answer any any further questions you might have. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you. So um, thank you so much for talking about Doshisha and obviously as a former JET, who's now a JET alum. So obviously that is a lot of the situation that our presenters, uh, sorry, not our presenters, not me, our, um, our viewers will be in. So thank you very much. So we will hear from Greg again in the Q&A, but now I'd like to pass to Deep to Khan. So to Johanna, so if you'd like to get your presentation ready, that would be great because we'd yeah. love to hear from a little bit further west. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Olivia. And just a second, when I share my screen, I hope everybody can see a picture of our campus. So um, again, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for the uh, Jetta Western for inviting me. Um, my name is Johanna. I'm originally from Finland and I am from the uh, Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University or APU, how everybody calls it. And we are located in um, Oita Prefecture in Beppu. And um, I work at the admissions office. So my uh, work mostly consists of supporting uh, international graduate students who want to come to study to APU. So um, today's presentation, um, I'm going to more talk about from the admissions point of view. So just general um, introduction overview, like what is APU? What kind of graduate school do we have? Uh, what can you study at APU and how to apply? So um, here is a picture of our campus and also um, the location of Beppu. And uh, our campus is actually located on top of a mountain. So we are not in the city center. It takes around 30, 40 minutes by bus uh, to the campus from the Beppu main station. It might take a little bit shorter depending on where you live. And um, there's a view of the uh, Peppu Bay here and also then the Oita city here. So it's re really beautiful campus. 
and a little bit about the history of our university. So APU was founded in 2000, so it's a relatively um, young university. However, we are within the um, Ritsumekan family or the Ritsumekan umbrella, so to speak. So in collaboration of the Ritsumekan University in Kyoto and then the Oita Prefecture and then the Beppu City, um, APU was founded to uh, be like the first international university in Japan. So not a Japanese university in Japan, but an international university. And what, what does this mean in practice is that um, APU maintains like a ratio of 50-50 of international and domestic students. So 50% of our students are from Japan, so Japanese, and then 50% are international. And um, also our faculty is the same, around 50-50. And the, um, here are some like the core values of APU and uh, that why the name is also Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University because one of those um, kind of values was the future shape of the Asia Pacific region. So um, the students were invited to come to the campus and learn about Japan and the Asia Pacific region um, in general. However, um, this has kind of expanded. So now it's also like global issues. And like we have students from all over the world, like from Latin America and um, Africa and Europe and so on. Um, so here are some facts and figures. So um, as I mentioned, like half of the students are Japanese and half of the students are um, international. And in total, we have around 6,000 students. However, our, our graduate school is a bit smaller. So the current number of graduate students is a bit over 200. And 99% um, are international. So it's almost um, completely international students. And uh, the graduate programs are also exclusively in English. So uh, what can you study at APU? So um, we have two graduate schools and um, the first one is the Graduate School of Management. And under this school, we have one program. So the MBA program, Master of Business Administration. And um, it's a two year program exclusively in English. So uh, to study at APU's graduate school, it is not necessary to know any Japanese to gain admissions or to study or to graduate. However, those students who wish to learn Japanese, um, the graduate students may study a beginner and intermediate level Japanese. And uh, two years or those students who want to graduate a little bit faster, also an option of one year and uh, one point, one and a half a year is also available. And uh, within the MBA degree, uh, the students may choose to obtain a specialization from this list or just um, graduate without a specialization. So there's some customization available in the curriculum. And uh, our second graduate school is the Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies. And uh, within this school, we offer three programs. So two masters, they are a master of science degrees and then one PhD, so a doctoral degree. And um, this school is more focused on social sciences and um, maybe humanities, um, maybe some economics also and sust sustainability as well. And um, the first program, Master in Asia Pacific Studies, um, the students may choose to belong to, in a division. So there's a division of international relations and then society and culture. And this Master in Asia Pacific Studies is maybe um, more focused on research. So maybe those who wish to have a, you know, academic career or maybe pursue a PhD in the future. And then the um, second program, so Master in International Cooperation Policy is more, more maybe policy oriented, maybe more for those who wish to have like find an employment um, 
or like work in with like global uh, issues after finishing their master's degree. And then also um, PhD in Asia Pacific studies. Uh, and then there's one specialty in uh, our APU's graduate school, it's the IMAT program. So this program is a two year program about um, zero emissions and sustainability. And in this program, the student will first spend one year at APU and then second year in Germany. So what about life after APU? So um, here is a list of our recent employers and also recent internships. So our graduates, they go work either in Japan or then back to home country or more often also like a third country. So you never know where like studying abroad may take you. Uh, recently, most of like many of our uh, MBA students have found employment in uh, Japan. However, usually this means like moving from Beppu, maybe to Tokyo or Osaka to Fukuoka, um, because um, there's a like a growing demand of English speaking, like workers or other languages in addition to uh, English. And um, even though like at our graduate school, it's not necessary to study Japanese. However, if you are looking like your primary reason to attend graduate school is to find employment uh, in Japan, it's uh, kind of recommended to uh, take the um, Japanese language courses because it will kind of expand or like um, create more opportunities to find employment in Japan. However, we do have some uh, recent graduates who have found uh, work employment in Japan, even with um, limited Japanese. And uh, about internships. So at APU, we have a career office that will help with like resume and, you know, the shukatsu, the kind of Japanese way of uh, finding employment. Of, and also through the career office, uh, the students may apply for internships. Uh, but this is not the only way, like we strongly encourage that our students kind of network together and most students actually find their internships like through someone they know. And our students and alumni are also very active on social media, so there's uh, countless Facebook groups and uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, where, um, you know, students are looking for, you know, advertising new um, like hiring and looking for jobs. And this is actually how many of our uh, students find internships and also um, jobs. And uh, just really quickly, uh, how to apply or who can apply. So to study at APU uh, have to have, so we have three uh, requirements. So first is um, degree like for the master's program it's the uh, bachelor's degree and then for the doctoral program it's the master's degree and then um, English language proficiencies so um, if you have graduated from a program that was provided with the um, medium of instruction in English then um, that kind of qualifies the uh, second requirement and then for the MBA program um, it is required to have three years of full-time working experience. And the application process uh, to APU, it's conducted entirely online and it consists of three steps. So one is the uh, online application form, uh, the application fee, and then online assessment and an interview. And then a little bit about scholarships. So um, we have quite at APU a lot of scholarship opportunities uh, for applicants. So scholarships that must be applied at the same time as applying to APU. And there are also lots of scholarships that are available for already enrolled students. And uh, here is a list of some of the major scholarships. So um, the Biggest one is our internal scholarship. So the APU tuition reduction scholarship that covers uh, 30, 50 
uh, 65, 80, or even 100 percent of the tuition, and all applicants can apply for this scholarship. And in addition, there's also uh, external scholarships uh, like MEXT, among others. So, a um, little bit about Peppu. I don't know how many of you have been to this uh, quite charming city. So, the population is around 120,000, and uh, Peppu is very famous for hot springs. It's the onsen capital of Japan, so there are like hot springs everywhere. And also we are surrounded by mountains, so there's a uh, lot of hiking opportunities, so really good place for like people who enjoy outdoors. Also, uh, compared to the bigger, bigger cities, uh, the rent and the cost of living in Peppu is quite affordable. And even though Peppu can be kind of considered as a bit traditional uh, Japanese city, the presence of the university kind of brings in an international twist. So uh, it's actually very uh, easy place for an international student to kind of adapt into. And also there's lots of part-time work opportunities. It feels like every time I go to some restaurant or uh, like a hotel or hostel or anywhere, there's always an APU student um, working there. And um, for our graduate students, uh, there's an off-campus housing. So there's a guaranteed room for all the graduate students. They are single rooms. However, um, the students are also completely free to look for their own um, apartments. And there are two enrollment options at APU. So you can start studying either uh, from April or from September. And uh, the application for 2023 will start on uh, September 1st. And um, so why study at APU? When asking um, this to our students, it, most of the students choose APU because they want to kind of experience the very um, global or diverse environment. So since our our university opened, we have have students from over 161 different countries. And currently in our graduate school, we have students more from more than 50 different countries. And also um, the second reason is scholarship opportunities. So actually over 95 of our graduate students have received some kind of scholarship, either during the admissions or then uh, after enrollment. And then also the um, third reason is the global career prospects. So um, by using the global network, um, there's a good chance of um, trying, maybe, you know, finding your next country or, you know, explore kind of opportunities. And um, we have social media, uh, please do, uh, do check it out. We have Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. On YouTube, we have alumni interviews and also drone tour. So you can see the campus. And uh, if you want to contact APU, uh, we have an admissions website. So uh, the Burgundy is for undergraduate and then the Navy is for graduate admissions. And um, the, within the admission website, there's a contact page where you can contact APU or then just um, email to this general inquiry email address. Okay, so um, that was all from me. So thank you so much for listening and uh, um, I look forward to receiving any questions um, after all the presentations. Thank you. Okay, so thank you from down in Befu. Thank you so much, Johanna, for talking about um, Bitsume Khan. And I wrote to Avery next to me, Khan, Asia Pacific University, or APU. Um, final presenter uh, we have from Temple, and he is also a former JET Alumni Association Western Japan team member. So we'd like to thank Eddie for being our final presenter. If you'd like to start, that would be great. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I 
I guess this is gonna this is gonna be a little bit informal because I'm not affiliated with Temple University, but I did go there uh, as a graduate student for uh, uh, two and a half years, and I graduated in 2017. Um, but to uh, to give a little info about myself, my name is Eddie Tang. Uh, I am from Arizona, and I moved to Japan in 2007 as a JET member. I taught at Fukui Prefecture for five years, and I enjoyed my time there. And I loved my time so much uh, as a teacher that I wanted to further my career as a teacher. So I moved to Osaka because there's a bigger teaching market over there. And uh, I uh, was looking for a little bit more uh, advancement in my career because uh, I found that uh, with um, the education that I had, which is an undergraduate degree, uh, it wasn't enough to get jobs in places like uh, university, things like that. Um, so I decided to uh, try out graduate school and uh, a person at the time that was working uh, at the same position as I was, which uh, I'm currently a Osaka City Board of Education uh, a teacher, uh, CNET. Um, that's what our division is called. Um, he told me about this program at a Temple University, Japan. Uh, they have a campus in Osaka and they also have one in Tokyo. And this master's program is for TESA. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, learning a lot more about methodologies, um, how to uh, basically uh, why we teach English. Um, we learn a lot about uh, different uh, uh, researchers and we also learn a little bit about uh, basic things like statistics, grammar, things like that. Um, it's definitely a great uh, program to be in. And uh, uh, there are a few things that, if you're interested, uh, the website is at tuj.ac.jp. Um, there are some things you have to keep in mind as you are uh, going through uh, the process of being a student at uh, TUJ. Uh, there is an initial registration fee. Um, there's also matriculation, which um, you have to matriculate, uh, basically declare that you're going to be uh, a TUJ uh, master's uh, program student. And uh, you have to do this by the time you finish your third class at the school. Um, you also must supply a GRE or MAT standardized test score uh, within five years of application. Uh, you will need a recommendation letter from a TUJ faculty member. Uh, you will also need to uh, send in an application and a personal statement about, uh, to apply. And uh, also there's a matriculation fee as well. So there's that. And uh, also uh, near the end of the program, uh, there's a comprehensive exam that you must pass uh, in order to uh, be able to graduate from the program. And also um, there is a class that will prepare you for the uh, comprehensive exam, which covers a lot of uh, the people, uh, people that are the leading researchers in the, the teaching field. And uh, once you do that, then uh, yeah, uh, it's about 40 hours. Um, the schedule is very, very, um, I, I would say it's very flexible. Um, it's uh, a lot of, you can either take evening classes or you can take week, uh, classes on weekends. And uh, not only that, um, the big thing about uh, TUJ is the fact that you can actually be at a campus. It's not an online experience. Uh, it's something that, I mean, there's a campus, uh, uh, the one I went to in Osaka was uh, 
uh, it, it was, uh, I forget what building it was, but it was in Umeda. And uh, I went to uh, that's, uh, that campus uh, about twice a week uh, to attend classes. And yeah, it was a good experience. I mean, if, I mean, it's just like uh, going to a, any sort of university, like brick and mortar, you're, you're there, you're having the experience, you're talking with the teacher face to face. And uh, you're also working with students locally so if you have projects to do or trying to do research together, it's a lot easier to do that than having Zoom meetings. And uh, I did this before uh, uh, COVID, uh, obviously. So I don't know if a lot has changed since then, but um, uh, yeah, I really felt like uh, I learned so much from this program. Uh, the things I did gain from this program uh, I began to understand a lot more about how to build the curriculum because before um, I relied on a lot of uh, activities just to have students uh, do things to keep them busy. But at the same time, I didn't know why I would be having these activities. So um, just, uh, the, uh, when I was going to uh, graduate school and learning about methodologies, I started to learn the, the why. Why do you teach? Why do you, why do you make lesson plans? And how do you make lesson plans uh, work? It's not as simple as just putting things together and hope that it sticks. You kind of need to learn how to um, basically uh, build your own teaching style, build your own beliefs. Why do you think uh, you should be teaching this grammar point? Why do you think you should teach it in this style and not the style that was handed to you from uh, like a lesson plan that was either given to you from someone else or from a book? You know, you can start to branch out in your own way and you'll be able to justify it because of what you have learned uh, from a master's program like TUJ. Um, also, uh, there are a lot of uh, methodologies that really help diversify my own teaching style to make it better suited for lesson plans uh, and the people that I was teaching to, uh, which really helped a lot because one size does not fit all in the teaching field, obviously. I mean, you want to be able to uh, kind of adjust to any sort of uh, circumstances that you might need to pay more attention to certain things that are going on in your classroom. And this really helped me uh, learning so much about methodologies, just being able to uh, kind of think more about how to just be able to think more about what my students need instead of what uh, just kind of following a lesson plan, basically. And uh, I was able to measure and organize empirical data. So it gave me the ability to conduct field research studies on my own, which is very, very good because a lot of times, uh, when you want to say that, oh, this method works, but you don't know how to present it as why it's effective. But uh, when I went through the TUJ program, I started to learn a lot more about how to collect this data and how to find these formulas to be able to show empirically that, yes, this is the reason uh, uh, this data proves that this is happening or not happening. So, but uh, yeah, uh, why I think TUJ is a very good school. Uh, I definitely think that they have excellent support. Uh, the network that you build from the professors, the advisors, and the fellow classmates that you have, it's very beneficial for. Uh, if you want to continue your 
uh, teaching career in Japan. Uh, definitely that big net, uh, the bigger network helps. I think it's a lot more beneficial than uh, if you take classes online and you don't have that local network to help you out once you try to find a job after you graduate. Um, also, TUJ had access to a lot of catalogs to help with research. So um, I don't have the names of the catalogs, but uh, yeah, every time uh, I needed to do research on certain uh, topics, it was very, very uh, easy to find and there was a lot to find out there. Uh, so definitely take advantage of that while, uh, when, if, when you, if you become a student there. Um, all classes are in English, so you don't have to worry about the language barrier at all. Uh, of course, Simple is uh, from a university uh, in Philadelphia, so yeah, that's why you don't have to worry about uh, your Japanese language. Uh, like I said, class schedules are very flexible, evening classes or weekend classes, definitely uh, very good, especially uh, if you don't want to worry about time zones. I know that uh, as an online student uh, for, I've known people who try to take uh, online courses and yeah, it was tough for them to attend classes when it's usually in the middle of the morning. So um, it's definitely, uh, uh, the Osaka location was very convenient. It's in Umeda, like I said, and they also have a campus in Tokyo. So if you live near either of those cities, then yeah, it's definitely very accessible for you. Um, one thing that is very beneficial is uh, something called the Distinguished Lecture Series, where uh, Temple University Japan always brings in a really good uh, researcher in the field uh, to come and talk. Uh, it used to be uh, on campus, but now it's on Zoom but it's a great opportunity to learn more about certain things in the field, certain topics, and to be able to uh, talk with them and be able to discuss uh, certain viewpoints that they have and learn more about these researchers and what they're doing in the field. Um, usually, uh, if you want to attend these uh, lecture series, uh, it's uh, usually on a Saturday and Sunday, and the Saturday is uh, open to the public. It's a three-hour session, but the second session, uh, which is more in detail, and uh, it's very beneficial if you can attend those uh, second sessions on Sundays. Uh, usually, if you want to attend those and you're not a student, uh, it would be 13,000 yen to attend, but if you are a student or alumni, you can attend those for free. So it's a very useful thing to have to keep your finger on the pulse of uh, the education field. And uh, basically, uh, TUJ is very recognizable as a, as a campus uh, here in Japan. So if you're trying to, like I said, further your career in Japan as a teacher, uh, having that on your resume will be much more uh, uh, how should I say it? Uh, it? It's definitely going to look good uh, rather than if you've studied uh, from an online university and sometimes the, the school that wants to hire, uh, they don't know what that school is. So it's definitely a plus to be able to be a student of TUJ. And yeah, that's about all I have. I'm sorry it's short, but yeah, um, like I said, it's informal. I'm not affiliated with TUJ, but I highly recommend them. I think they're great. Okay, no, thank you. So um, it was really good to hear. We've got lots of different perspectives here, but I know no one really wants to hear what I have to say. So um, I will start the QA session. And just before I start, I wanna make sure we will put all of the contact info for the different universities that we've spoken about today in the chat, and we will also publish them later. So if you wanna follow up with any of the presenters, you can do so. But I will start off the Q&A session. So feel free to jump in as you guys see fit. 
So one question I had was, what are some issues that uh, graduate students face when they study in Japan? If you can think of one specific issue, that would be great. So I'll just, I'm happy to go in order. So Greg, if you'd like to start, what do you think one of the big issues is? Yeah, um, I, I briefly mentioned it, but I think, uh, you know, um, food issues. Um, so we've, we had a few students last year actually from Egypt um, and they were Islam uh, or, or, you know, they, they worshiped Islamic. And um, so it was very, tr very difficult for one fellow uh, to find, um, you know, halal food. Um, and he was very strict about, about that. So he lost probably like 10 or 15 kilos at one point. Um, so maybe that's kind of an extreme, but, uh, I, I did see that, you know, sometimes, uh, based on religion or maybe kind of, uh, other philosophical, uh, principles like being vegetarian, um, did have, uh, have a bit of a, you know, um, an influence on, on how some of the students were, were able to get along in Japan. Great. So I think we'll go now to Johanna at APU. Yeah, yeah thank you. So um, one thing that I kind of thought was that um, it depends maybe where you are coming from, but maybe the um, kind of the separation of um, work and private life or school and private life is that, um, for example, if you are living in your apartment, so you are an APU student living in your own apartment, and maybe you have friends over, and you know, you cook together, you have some fun. And then it might be that instead of your neighbors, you know, they might be a bit maybe annoyed by the noise. So instead of dealing with you directly, they might actually call the university because they are assuming you are part of the university and you are kind of the ambassador of the university. So it may come a bit of a surprise how easily um, maybe some of the local people might actually go like the indirect way to complain instead of coming directly to you. And this was also something that was quite surprising to me that instead of talking to me, uh, the whoever had something to say to me went through the landlord or then the university so for some people this might maybe be a feel of like like this is a private matter why that what has my school have to do anything with it but it does happen so for some students especially from western countries it might be quite surprising and at least for me it was very surprising because I think my private life does not have anything to do with school or maybe the company. So that's what I thought. And it might continue. Some former Jets might have lived very in very small communities where they may have experienced something similar to that. So to see that continue might be quite a shock when they feel like graduate school might be not that way. So no, thank you for that. Um, finally, Eddie, did you have anything to say about issues that you found or issues that you think potential Jets might face becoming graduate students? Um, well, definitely time management is very key when it comes to juggling graduate school with a full-time job or several part-time jobs because um, uh, it is an intensive uh, type of course. So it's going to take a lot of your free time away and you just have to be able to uh, put priorities on what you want to, well, uh, some people have to take their home, uh, work home with them when they're teaching and they have to set up things like activities or tests, things like that. And then on top of that, you have a very busy schedule uh, for graduate school, especially if you take two classes, uh, like uh, I did from time to time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it becomes really hectic, but uh, my advice is just... Uh, get into a rhythm, get into a routine. And there's always going to be a little bit of time for a break, but you just have to be able to uh, focus and try not to fall behind because it's really easy to fall behind when you're doing full-time job and graduates, uh, graduate work. And I know people who are doing their PhD at Temple and that's even busier. So. 
yeah, but it's a huge challenge. And that's what I would recommend. Try to focus on your time management. Yeah, so that's definitely an issue as well, particularly um, for jets who maybe have a lot of free time uh, while they're a jet. Uh, Cause as we know, some jets, every situation is different. So some jets have a lot of free time and maybe some don't have so many. So I'm just gonna pass over to my co-chair. I think he has a question or two he'd like to ask. Yeah, I did have a couple questions, but uh, actually first, I do wanna make a quick comment about Temple. Um, and all of these speakers, again, thank you guys so much for coming and speaking. Um, they are speaking about graduate programs and degree granting programs. However, at some of these universities, there are non-degree granting programs. There are options to um, just go for a class or two. Um, and actually at Temple, they have something called the Continuing Education Program. Eddie, I'm not sure if you're aware of it. Uh, I'm actually a student right now in the Continuing Education Program. I mean, they yeah. offer a wide range of things. Were you gonna say something? No, no, no I, I, okay. I, I heard about it, yes. Uh, I'm not a part of it, but yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. You can take it. I believe it's all based out of the Tokyo campus. However, I'm based in Osaka and there's still a lot of classes you can take online. So I'm entirely taking uh, interpretation and translation classes, which are really great, but they have a whole wide range of things. And if I look at a website earlier, uh, it ranges from, I mean, education, of course, design, data analytics, accounting, legal studies, marketing. Um, these are all just casual classes you can take, or if you take enough, they'll grant you a certificate. So there are lots of options for JET alumni in Japan who are just looking for a class or two to help supplement their current job or their current studies. Um, and I am also aware that Temple has a 15% discount on tuition for JET alumni. Nice. Uh, nice. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know about that until I was already in halfway through this. And then I found out about that. I was like, well, that would have saved me a few man yen, but better yeah. late than that. So but, I'm uh, aware about that program. I also saw that they have a JLPT uh, class. Uh, I saw one for N2. Yeah, so that's if you're interested in that. Yeah, they have, for non-native English speakers, they have English language programs. Uh, they have Japanese language programs for JLPT prep courses. Yeah, I haven't taken those, but if they're anything like the translation courses, I'm sure they're really good. So I highly recommend that. Uh, so going back to questions on the concept of money, uh, Greg, earlier, you mentioned the uh, scholarship Congratulations on 100% scholarship. That is fantastic. Can you give advice for people who maybe want to get that scholarship? You said you got lucky. Yeah. Was there something that went into that? Or can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I actually don't. They didn't tell me. I asked them as well, like, why, why was I the, the lucky guy who got it? So they didn't really go to de into detail and they, they don't release that information. So my my best guess would be maybe because I'm kind of one of the the older students and maybe it was they're trying to attract um, you know people who have uh, more work experience is is kind of what I was thinking. Um, it it depends on the year, of course, like uh, how the age skews. Um, sometimes it skews maybe a bit younger. Sometimes it skews a bit older. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what. Uh, the only the only idea I had. Um, so yeah, sorry, um, I have a definitive about, answer. When in your application process were you notified that you received the full scholarship? Yeah, so so basically, uh, with 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 the business school at Toshisha, they they have the rounds all the way up to I believe the end of June, and then you find out uh, in July, basically. Um, if you've successfully been, um, uh, if, you've, if you've been, if you've kind of allowed to enter. And then I think it was around the same time that they tell you if you got the scholarship. So okay. it's, it's actually not until you are accepted and then roughly about a month or even, even sooner, wh whether you know if you got, so it's the 50 or the 100% that you that you that there, there's the options so you 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 understand if you got the 50 or the 100 percent you definitely get 30 percent at least okay yeah 
Well, that's something to look forward to because I'm sure some people getting that scholarship or not does determine some of their next steps. Definitely. So if there's a chance for them to maybe break out of the admissions process by the time they get that, that might be helpful for them to make decisions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's most of the questions. That's actually the biggest question that I was really learning. Um, if Eddie or Johanna, you want to pipe in about um, financial aid, I know it was discussed a little bit earlier, but financial aid, scholarships, things like that. If you have any advice in general about that, we would appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you. So uh, about getting that 80% off or 100% off, um, of course, you know, can't reveal too much, but um, there are some things that are good to kind of consider when, you know, creating the application is like, so first kind of familiarize yourself with the application process. So what are the documents that are being requested and why are those documents requested? And what if there's interview, what might they ask in the interview? And um, if there's an assessment, you know, what's going to be asking that assessment. So kind of prepare for the entire process. And also like a lot of like what I always tell applicants is like ask lots of why questions. So why this program? Why this university? Uh, why am I doing this? And, you know, kind of think like what? what I'm trying to achieve by going through this graduate school and why, for example, why at APU or Temple University or Dosisa? So like, for example, at APU, we have the APU values. So the Asia Pacific region. So um, if you already have a thesis topic in mind, how well does it actually fit into APU? So if it's like, for example, international relations in Asia Pacific, that's like perfect. But if it's something completely different, then like, yeah, it might maybe affect the evaluation. So kind of like why questions and concrete answers. And also like the past, current and the future. That's like the advice from the admissions. That's actually very valuable advice. Thank you. Yeah, look at the document, think, there's a specific reason why they're asking for this document. I better make sure I get all the information that they need for it and in a way that probably looks best. Yeah, like are you and the university the perfect match, so to say. So Greg was a perfect match for this show. Good to know. <laughs> Actually, I was I was gonna add on to that. Um, yeah, it's, that's an amazing advice. So I think. I think with myself, because uh, my experience actually hit some of the areas um, or, or some of my experience was in some of the areas of the programs that they offer. Because the, the program, you know, they're, they're looking at it from, okay, so once someone graduates from the program, how do they represent the program going forward, right? So how, how basically can you kind of make them look good in the sense? So as, as Johanna said, you know, if, if you can show the, the, the fit between, you know, where you want to go um, in the future and how the MBA program will help you get to that and achieve that, um, that I think that's, that's it's, it's a perfect marriage, right? So. All right, thank you guys. Um, I believe we might be good to go on questions. So I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Oh, and I'm sorry, Eddie, did you have anything to add about scholarships and things like that? Uh, I couldn't find any scholarships for the graduate program, but um, okay. I did apply for financial aid. It was quite, uh, I would say, uh, it wasn't very difficult at all to apply. I did a FAFSA uh, type of uh, deal. Um, as a US citizen, uh, all I had to do was fill out a few forms and talk to my advisor and then they got it squared away. And yeah, I'm uh, taking care of that with my financial officer. And yeah, it's not, not difficult at all. Um, there's also a GI Bill as well, but I don't know outside of anyone outside of the US if they can apply for financial aid. I don't know how that would work, but yeah, if you're a US citizen, it's not too difficult. 
Uh, that's a very good point. So FAFSA um, and GI Bill, these are all terms surrounding financial aid for US citizens. Um, so if you're not a US citizen, it might be a little different for Temple University. So that might require extra looking up since Temple is a US university and not a Japanese institution. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point, thank you, I didn't think about that. All right, uh, thank you guys so much, all three of you for answering those questions and providing all your talks and everything. So I think we are going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, Liv, thank you so much for emceeing today. We are gonna pass it on over to Rose who will give a few closing comments. Thank you, John. And um, again, thank you to Greg and Joanna and Eddie for sharing their valuable information and experience with us. And thank you to all the participants that made time to listen in. And we're very happy to have you here with us on our virtual webinar series. And as John mentioned earlier, we are gradually moving back to in-person events. Um, of course, it, uh, we're keeping an eye on the, the COVID situation. Um, I saw a headline today that Osaka just had like, you know, almost 5,000 new cases. So um, before we get too excited about in-person events again, we're, we just wanna make sure everybody's safe. But we are hopefully um, looking into doing a Bonenkai or Shinenkai. Um, we would love to have new volunteers help us with planning. If you have any ideas for events, um, please do contact us. We um, are kind of slow in our, our social media. <laughs> a lot of our, our information is still unfortunately only Facebook uh, based, but we, we're gradually branching out. So if you're a social media expert, we'd love to have you as a volunteer. Um, we are working on a web page and um, getting on other forms of social media. So um, just pop any one of us a, a message and we'd be very, very happy for your um, help and cooperation. So thank you again for joining us and uh, stay tuned to Facebook for the time being for our next upcoming event. Take care, everybody. <laughs>